In our next two videos, we are going to combine what we've learned about shading three-dimensional forms and creating value scales using complementary colors. We'll use these concepts as we finish our candy composition still lives. Please note that the image you see here is not mine. In the description, there's a link to the talented teacher who created this picture and inspired our own candy lesson. Let's begin with shading a sphere. In my opinion, spheres are actually the most challenging three-dimensional form to shade. There are no lines or edges to tell you where a shadow stops. Reference our previous videos and worksheets to gauge how much you should shade on your sphere and where. With the shadow of Odie my cat watching over me, I'm starting with my core shadow. Just as when we practiced our value scales, I'm slowly building up the color to achieve a nice dark green because this is my core shadow. Again, note how my core shadow does not go completely to the edge of my sphere. Instead, there is a small space for the reflected light. We remember that reflected light is light reflected off of the surface on which the sphere would sit. As I get closer to my light source, which I've designated at the top left of my sphere, my pressure will get lighter and lighter. I am going to leave an area that is white for my very brightest highlight. We know that in creating value from complementary colors, our base layer and our top layer are always opposites. So my top layer will be red, which sits on the opposite side of the color wheel from green and is thus complementary. As we discussed in class, complementary colors have a neutralizing effect on one another. This means that they will create deep, rich shadows. Now I can select one or more red hues and simply overlap it on top of my green. For this first layer of red, I'm going to follow the exact same shading process that I just did for the green. I'll have my highlight, midtones, and core shadow, as well as the reflected light. If you'd like to achieve an even deeper shadow, you could then try layering a few more times with red and green. By going back with my red, pressing really hard, I am completing a process called burnishing. This creates a very smooth, almost shiny surface, which is great when drawing realism. I am going to do the same burnishing technique over my highlight with some white. This will create a very pronounced and almost shiny lightest light of my sphere. You'll remember from our earlier video that for shadows, I simply flip my complementary colors. So in short, I'm going to start with red this time and then layer with green. This creates contrast between my red sphere and my green shadow, working to separate the cast shadow from the rest of my form. To achieve a nice, deep, and rich shadow, you may have to layer multiple times and press pretty hard. As with anything with colored pencils, it takes patience. But when done correctly, the results are beautiful and very realistic. We'll apply these exact same principles to all the other forms we see today. Let's move on to a cylinder. To review, I start by drawing an ellipse or sort of a smooshed oval at the top, then draw two lines down and a curved line to match the curve of my ellipse at the bottom. As always, I then go back over my darker lines with an eraser to make sure that the pencil lines are light and will not distract from my coloring. For this form, I'm going to use orange and blue, another set of complementary colors. I think I'm going to start with a blue base, beginning with my core shadow. Again, this will be the darkest part of my form, the part furthest away from my light source. As with my sphere, and any form in fact, I need to make sure that my cylinder has its core shadow, midtones, a highlight, and reflected light. Of course, I'll also add my cast shadow later. Having fast forwarded the video, it's now time to add my overlay of orange. 
It may take you a little bit of practice building, erasing, and rebuilding color to get something that you're truly happy with. Don't worry. In fact, I messed up and forgot where the shadow would be placed on the top of my cylinder. Shadows on cylinders actually happen opposite where they occurred on this side. This is a quick fix, but I wanted to keep it in the video to show you that even people who've drawn things a thousand times still make mistakes. Be patient with yourself. Our last smooth-sided object today is the cone. As you'll see in a second, shading a cone is actually very similar to shading a cylinder. Your lines just go at a diagonal instead of vertically. For this, I'm going to use yellow and purple, the trickiest set of complementary colors. As you may recall from the video we watched in class, you'll want to choose a warmer shade of purple. So this purple that I've chosen here leans toward red on the color wheel. This keeps our yellow from becoming muddied. If you need to darken your shadow later, as we'll soon see, you can always add a bit of a cooler purple as well in your core shadow. As I mentioned earlier, shading a cylinder is very, very similar to shading a cone. Your lines are just at a slant or a diagonal instead of vertical. If we fast forward, we can see that I definitely need to deepen that core shadow. I can accomplish this by lightly layering a bit of cooler purple over top of that core shadow area. I will do the same soon with my cast shadow, but remember, the colors on my cast shadow are reversed, so this time it is first yellow and then purple. Notice how the shape of my cast shadow changes with the shape of my form. For example, the cast shadow from my cone has a much more defined point than the cast shadow from either my sphere or my cylinder. All right, let's pause the video here. Give these a try and then tune into the second video to learn about shading forms that have defined flat edges. I'll talk to y'all soon. Bye.